Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you and welcome you all to this uh, web panel webinar, uh, Persistent Identifiers PIDS panel uh, for CALL. I am Cynthia Holt, the Executive Director for CALL, um, and I will be doing a few little housekeeping things first, and then I'll be turning the session over to our moderators. Uh, so I would uh, like to remind folks, if you can, to if you're not presenting uh, to uh, or on the panel, uh, to please turn off your video and mute your microphones uh, during the session just to save on bandwidth uh, for our, uh, some folks coming in from low bandwidth areas and optimize the, uh, the session for everybody. Uh, also, uh, if you need to ask a question, you can unmute and uh, share your video at that time uh, but just until then uh, if you can keep them off um, I our moderators today uh, are Julie Morris collections analysis and bibliometrics librarian at the University of New Brunswick and Melissa Rothfuss who is the scholarly communications librarian at Dalhousie University um, and just as a reminder we are recording this session it will be posted fairly shortly afterwards to the call website and YouTube channel and anybody everybody who registered will receive uh, a notification once the recording is posted uh, without further ado, I will turn things over to Julie and Melissa. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so I just want to um, say hello. My name is Julie Morris. Uh, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, I'm the Collections Analysis and Bibliometrics Librarian at the University of New Brunswick. I'm also the chair of the CALL CBPA Scholarly Communications Committee. I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, Melissa Rothfuss from Dalhousie, um, who will be helping me facilitate today's conversation. We'll be taking, uh, taking turns um, interacting with the panel. Before we start, I would just like to uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. So called CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, of uh, Nunat Siavut and Nunatekavut, the Innu of Nitasinen, the Beotuk, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territories of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the Wallistigwig, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. We're pleased to welcome you to today's panel on persistent identifiers. We're welcomed today by Lisa Goddard, who's the Associate University Librarian of Advanced Research Services at the University of Victoria. Uh, we are also joined by my colleague, Mike Nason, who is the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at the University of New Brunswick and John Aspler, who is the manager of the Canadian Persistent Identifier Community at CRKN. We're going to start today with a very brief introduction to PIDS from Mike Nason, uh, who will provide us with some context about what PIDS are and uh, just give us a very brief overview. Then we'll move to a panel discussion with our three guests, where they'll discuss their experience with PIDS, as well as the PID landscape in Canada. At the end, um, I will just ask that we hold our questions until the end. Uh, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat uh, during the session, and we'll um, at the end we'll uh, we'll reserve some time for Q and A, where you'll have the chance to ask Lisa, John, and Mike questions of your own. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike Nason. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm going to try to blow through this as quickly as I can because uh, it's a lot to cover and I had uh, somewhat of a meltdown trying to boil down what persistent identifiers are into a five minutes free. So I'm going to do my best. Um, uh, I have other slides linked here. So if you want to learn more, please do look at them, uh, but uh, without uh, any further delay. So persistent identifiers. Um, 
Uh, again, I'd love to really dive deep here and talk about PIDs and how they work and stakeholders and providers, um, but we only have five minutes. So I'm going to I'm gonna get moving, but I have decks and videos here to other webinars if folks want to uh, see other content and learn more. So what is a PID? PID is short for persistent identifier. Uh, half of this should make complete sense to you. We have identifiers for all kinds of things all the time. Social insurance numbers, driver's licenses, license plates, Medicare, student ID. Uh, identifiers typically refer to physical objects that are often created or managed locally. They're useful for record keeping and data data retrieval, searchability, and they're also hugely useful for disambiguation. Take, for example, a social insurance number. There is more than one Mike Nason in Canada, but only one of them has my social insurance number, I hope. Um, so persistent, uh, not to be confused with permanence, means long lasting, a function of the life of the service that is stewardship over a kind of identifier, and then identifier, a unique string or pattern referring to an object, person, document, file, website, skyscraper, sunflower seed, on future film bicycle unicorn whatever you get it any type of thing in librarianship we use a sort of dizzying array of persistent identifiers could be any of these ISSN, ISBN, doi handle arc orchid roar scopus id oclc number we got a bajillion uh, but in the context of publishing an open scholarly infrastructure we can narrow this down into some especially vital pids and the ones i'm going to talk about today are doi orchid and roar uh, this is a little reductive and we can talk about that but also tick talk. DOIs are the big ones, so let's pivot to these real quick. DOIs are ubiquitous. We see them all over the place in references, bibliographies, article, journal websites, repositories, data sets, and links, and we probably know one very handy thing about them. If you click on a DOI that looks like a link, it will take you to the thing. DOIs are the most prominent persistent identifier. They are also arguably the most important persistent identifier. DOIs are made up of two chunks, and each means different things. There's a prefix, which is usually associated with a publisher or organization. DOIs for that organization will usually have the same prefix. Uh, a suffix is meant to be a machine-readable, not human-readable. People are very tempted to make these human-readable. Uh, opaque, unique string that is specific to the singular work to which it is assigned. So prefix and a suffix. If I prepend a DOI with HTTPS colon slash slash DOI.org, it turns into a URL. Clicking this will redirect me to the publication this DOI is associated with. This process of a DOI re redirecting you to a publication is called resolution. And resolution is facilitated by registration agencies, which I will talk about in a second. <clears throat> Vitally, DOIs are not just like a bit.ly link or a tiny URL. They are not just basic redirecting links. Uh, I hear this a lot. I recently heard that somebody from OCLC said that DOIs just do basic redirection, and I almost lost my mind. <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, if you're not familiar with redirection services, uh, they swap out really large and unwieldy links so that you can share something that isn't enormous. So for example, we've got a bit.ly link for a talk I did on Open Scholarly Infrastructure on the top, and then in the middle of the actual URL for that top. It's a short the link and makes it easier to share. Bitly and tiny URL are both basic redirects. Uh, plenty of people treat DOIs this way or assume it's their only real function. Uh, this is complicated by the fact that handles do kind of essentially work this way and we're very familiar with handles from years of using DSpace. You get an ID and then it redirects you to the work. So people kind of assume that they all do the same thing or wildly swinging in the other direction they ascribe fresh meaning to DOIs and make some wild presumptions about DOIs as some sort of signifier for scholarly legitimacy equally as baffling but way in the other direction. Um, so it falls somewhere in the middle. DOIs are a lot more than redirects. Any single DOI is a reference to an entire publication record and one that is full of metadata. And one of these metadata elements is the publication's URL. When you resolve a DOI by clicking on it, the record is accessed, the stored URL is retrieved, and you are sent to the stored URL. The URL can be updated by the publisher, the DOI stays the same. And depending on the registration agency that DOI is registered to and what kind of work it is, there's a boatload of other metadata that you can access with that DOI. So unlike publications themselves, metadata and publishing is typically free until someday that Elsevier decides to ruin our lives even more than they are, I guess. <laughs> but for now, metadata is typically free and we can learn a lot from it. Um, so Crossref, for example, can store the following things, not inclusive as publicly accessible metadata, title, subtitle, authors, orchids, affiliation, copyright license, funder and grant IDs, languages of the work, ROAR, references, resource locations, versions, publishers, journal volume issues related DOI dates, and abstracts. The metadata is, as you might have guessed, hugely useful. 
Uh, just within Crossref, here are some things you can look up. So you can look up article level metadata for a specific DOI. You can look up title level meta metadata at that prefix level. You can do a search for all titles in a given prefix. You can do a search for all works registered to a specific ORCID or works affiliated with grants or most cited by prefix, all sorts of different things that you can query against the Crossref API, which is public, and get information back based on what's been registered with Crossref. These are all calls on a public API just for metadata. This is a fraction of the sorts of queries you can make against this metadata. These are all linked, by the way, and I will show the slides and you can click on these and see API results, which is nice. Uh, but when the infrastructure is connected, not just Crossref, you could also, for example, have publications automatically added into an ORCID record. Or you could find all the works in open air written by researchers from any specific institution. Or you could get publishing metrics about the journals my faculty publish in via Open Alex. Or I could reveal relationships between a funder, a specific grant ID, and all of the various products of scholarship created and disseminated as a result. Uh, I could evaluate the completeness of my published metadata with a variety of tools. All of this sort of stems from the connection of all of these places that have registered all of this metadata. Persistent identifiers are managed by registration agencies, typically international not-for-profits, that store records and metadata, facilitate resolution requests, and may or may not offer other services based on membership. And they do a lot of this through APIs. There are a lot of registration agencies, and I won't go over them all here. Um, each agency may differ in mandate, governance, scope, service, supported objects, membership terms, and feature sets. There are like handfuls of places that do DOI registration, and they don't all do it the same way. Not all DOIs record the same metadata, uh, and they don't all have the same governance structure for those who manage those DOIs. But they do often work together and share data. So quick overview, Pits for Scholarly Works with a publishing flavor, that's Crossref. Um, they use DOIs. Uh, most scholarly publishers are Crossref members. At the time I wrote this a month ago, Crossref had 155 million DOIs registered with their service. They're a big deal. They register DOIs for articles, proceedings, monographs, funding agencies, grants, reports, standards, and preprints. They can register for data sets, but they would recommend you use Datasite. Uh, Datasite are Pits for Scholarly Works in the repository context. So while some scholarly publishers do use data site for article DOIs. It's much more commonly used in data and institutional disciplinary repositories. Data site and Crossref work together to connect research data to publications. Uh, and in data site, you would typically see submissions of software, data sets, collections, audio, visual, events, models, and publications sometimes. Then we have PIDs for researchers, uh, uh, John's favorite subject, ORCID, um, Scopus ID and Web of Science Researcher ID. ORCID are the go-to here. Scopus and Web of Science offerings are both restricted to publications present on those platforms and also run by uh, giant for-profit oligopolies. Um, but these services can all share data in between each other. And then lastly, PIDs for organizations. Roar is the current front runner here, really picking up steam. Uh, the predominant use case for organizational IDs is in strengthening connections between records using open scholarly infrastructure. Most researchers are never going to need to know their ROAR. It'll show up as a drop down under the name of their institution in an affiliation field. But that metadata existing in, say, a Crossref record means that all of a sudden I can pull everything in Crossref that is from a specific institution, which is awesome. Registration agencies provide metadata schema through which users can describe the objects they are registering PIDs for. As you can imagine, you describe a person differently than you describe a data set or a journal article or an organization. Even when agencies use the same type of PID, like the DOI, the schema may vary. This network of APIs connecting these PID registration agencies to each other, uh, open services, and all of these other systems um, are increasingly relied upon by researchers and institutions, whether or not they're really aware of it. Almost all open scholarly infrastructure is based around APIs and the ability to easily push and pull this metadata around to those who need it. Open scholarly infrastructure is a network of scholarly research focused open source platforms and service providers and APIs that work in concert to share data, eliminate relationships and make research more discoverable. The key here is metadata. The metadata we get out of these systems and its utility is very much dependent on its quality. We have a general expression in the metadata universe that's garbage in, garbage out. If you give bad data to Crossref, you're not going to get good data out of Crossref. The fidelity of the metadata at the point of publication is vital, and it's kind of everybody's responsibility. But part of the reason these agencies have risen into the positions they're in now is because of their approaches to interchangeable, retrievable, and reusable metadata. So congratulations. You now know more about DOIs than, frankly, a surprising amount of people. And by extension, you know more about PIDs than a, frankly, surprising amount of people. Uh, I am almost always happy to answer questions about this stuff. Um, so please reach out if you need to. And it is time for the panel. Thanks, Mike. That was uh, a lot on PIDs very quickly. Um, so yeah, the uh, 
if it's okay with you, we'll make the slide deck available to folks so they can review it uh, at their leisure. Um, okay, so we'll get started with the panel, uh, Lisa, John, and Mike. I'm going to get started by just asking you to introduce yourself, uh, your position, and just very briefly what it is you do. And we'll start okay. with, um, yeah, we'll start with Mike. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I just talked a bunch. Uh, I'm an yeah. open scholarship and publishing librarian at uh, the University of New Brunswick, and I'm also the Crossref and Metadata Liaison for the Public Knowledge Project. Uh, those are the two big things. Um, I do just about everything, <laughs> and I am very tired. <laughs> how's, that? how's that for an introduction? That's great. Uh, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Goddard. I am the Associate University Librarian for uh, Advanced Research Services at the University of Victoria. Um, I am also part of the Forward Linking Project and the Links Project before that. Um, really thinking about linked data in libraries and GLAM institutions generally. Um, and I am not the one who usually does the work, actually. Um, I just sort of have ideas and then other people make it happen, but um, I know enough to talk reasonably confidently in this session. And John. Thanks so much, Julie. So uh, yeah, I'm the manager of the Canadian Persistent Identifier community at uh, CRKN. I work very closely with Mike and Lisa, both of whom have served a great deal on various committees related to persistent identifiers in Canada, so uh, both are selling themselves short. Uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot that they do uh, with PIDs, especially around the governance. Um, at CRKN, we manage two different PID communities. We've got the uh, Orchid Canada Consortium and we've got the Datacite Canada Consortium. And uh, so we actively provide services around Orchid IDs and around DOIs specifically from Datacite. But we're also in the process of looking to develop a national strategy for PIDs in Canada. There's this one giant committee called the Canadian Persistent Identifier Advisory Committee, or the CIPIDAC. Uh, Lisa was technically the inaugural chair of that as we switched over from a previous version of that committee um, and has been sitting on it for like six years now. Uh, and that committee is doing a lot of the work around thinking beyond just ORCID and data site. What can we do with Crossref? What can we how can we help fund and offset various fees for these things? Because that's also a big part of what we do. We don't just run the consortia, we offset the fees for them. So uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll dig into this a lot more, but I'll, I'll end there. Great, All right. thank you. Thank you guys. So let's start with the next question. And I think uh, this one, will, we'll start with you, Lisa. Uh, our next question is, um, it's actually kind of a two-pronged question. So to start, we would like to ask, what are the common uses for PIDs in your institution or the institutions uh, you work with? And the second part of that is, why are PIDs important to the work that you do? Sure, happy to talk about this. So at UVic, uh, we use PIDs in a variety of ways. First of all, we do something that many of you probably do, which is we use cross-ref DOIs for the journal articles that we publish in OJS. The libraries maintain the subscription. We pay for this service for all of the folks that we host on OJS. So that's a service that we're offering to our publishers. We apply data site DOIs for works in our local digital collections. Um, so that's our sort of Fedora platform, which we call Vault, where we digitize a lot of our special collections. Each of those have a data site DOI applied. We are now exploring data site DOIs for our electronic theses and dissertations. Those sit in the DSpace platform. So there are a couple little challenges there um, because ideally we'd like to apply DOIs just to that collection, not necessarily to everything that we have in DSpace. Some of that stuff has DOIs and you know it's a little bit complicated, but that's something we're considering now. We're also involved in a pilot to extend our data site DOI services to UVic Research Computing because they do a lot of platform development and they also have some of the same needs that we have. So we're trying to see if we can use our subscription for other folks at the university as well. When it comes to ORCID, we help faculty members to populate their ORCID profiles. So we actually will do hands-on work with your CV to get information into your profile if you're interested. We're really, really sort of encouraging our faculty to get those ORCID profiles populated. Um, we use the ORCID plugin in OJS to capture author IDs for our 
publications there. And we use the ORCID API to provide login services for the HSS Commons, which is developed and based at UVic, among other platforms. We have recently finished the DSpace 7 upgrade, so now we're going to be looking at the ORCID plugin for DSpace. Um, UVic, unfortunately, does not have a research information system because from my perspective, that is really the place at the university where a lot of these PIDs could be sort of tied together and you'd really start to see the utility of that sort of ability to automatically transfer information around. Um, and, you know, UVic does have Aurora, but we have about 12 different identifiers that are used variously. So getting the university to use the roar that we have consistently through all the records is something that we're working on. I think PIDs are important to the work that we do in libraries for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, you really do need to have a URL that points reliably to a resource that has been cited. So just in the really most basic kind of citation area, um, having PIDs where, where researchers can reference our resources is absolutely critical. Um, but for me, really, the the promise of PIDs is the reduction of administrative burden, just the reduction in the need to rekey the exact same publication and grants and institutional information into so many different places for reporting and various things. I think that once we really truly see these kind of integrations in a critical mass, researchers will be very, very happy with what PIDs can do for them. And, you know, libraries will be as well because we're creating this enormous mass of structured data that's highly interoperable, that's global, and that allows us to understand um, the global kind of research networks and the publications that come out of those grants and everything else. So it is, it does have um, a purpose far beyond just providing a persistent identifier for, for uh, an object, for example. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, John, I'm going to ask you the same question just to refresh your memory. We're, we're talking about common uses for PIDs at your institution and how are they important to the work that you do? Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, so this is a bit of a um, this this question maybe is less applicable to me directly. Obviously, my whole entire role exists to serve the PID using community in Canada. CRK in itself as an organization, really it has three core functions. We are the not-for-profit that has a licensing program that negotiates access to content for academic libraries across Canada. We have, uh, we merged in 2018 with an organization called Canadiana. So we also have a digital heritage platform that we maintain both in English and French, Canadiana and Heritage. And then uh, the third pillar, the newest pillar is the PID program. And some of the ways that the PID program informs some of the other work we're doing, perhaps, uh, which might be worth saying, we have something like 60 million objects in the Canadiana archive, right? This is an archive of Canadian digital heritage. We've got, you know, uh, student newspapers from Saskatchewan in 1905, things like that. That's sort of what is stored in there, among many, many, many other things. And what we really need for those objects is less of the connection and interoperable pieces for now uh, that Mike was talking about, which are so core to PIDs. What we need is permanent links that resolve properly. So one of the PIDs we use is something called an ARC, an archival resource key. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's useful in some cases, but why DOIs are still really, really important in most other cases, uh, I'm sure in a little bit. But this is because what well, one thing to, to put in context here is that there are about 58 million DOIs total maintained by Datasite and maybe 160 million DOIs maintained by Crossref. If we were to create 60 million DOIs for the Canadiana collection alone, that would just it, it's it's it just is not an appropriate use case for that. So, um, you know, there are some ways that we're thinking about how DOIs and ARCs might be able to work together. Maybe if we have 60 million ARCs pointing to each individual object, um, possibly we could have DOIs at the collection level. Maybe this is a few hundred thousand DOIs, which is much more reasonable and inside the scope of how many DOIs exist in the world. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're using PIDs as an organization. But also these three pillars at CRKN are, um, I don't want to say siloed. They all have their own function. We do try to make them work together as best we can, like how PIDs are being applied to Canadiana. But, you know, the, the answer for you know, why are PIDs important to the work I do? I mean, I am one full FTE dedicated to the project of advancing, you know, connection, interoperability, and disambiguation of digital research entities across the Canadian research landscape. So, you know, we support the uh, 
all of the institutions that are registering DOIs through Datacite in Canada. We have about 68 members in Datacite Canada. We've got 48 members in ORCID Canada. Um, I can certainly talk a little bit about the distinction between individual researchers who are creating and using their ORCID records, and then the institutions that are providing funding to ORCID to sustain it as a not-for-profit, as a PID registration agency. And so the services we provide to the institutions and how we need to sort of bring these actors closer together, the scholars who are creating their ORCID records, and then the institutions that are connecting ORCID to their systems so that scholars can more easily enter and push things into it. Um, but yeah, besides the ARC example at CRK in itself, there isn't a huge amount we're doing. Uh, maybe, maybe actually one other thing I'll add is um, a recent initiative that we've started is all of our board members. We have so many boards at CRKN, and three of those boards are PID boards. We have 10 people on the ORCID Canada Governing Committee, 10 people on the Datacite Canada Governing Committee, and something like 28 people now on the Canadian PID Advisory Committee. So, you know, at any given time, we've got about 50 volunteers engaging with the Canadian PID governance, which is great, very robust governance. Um, and one of the things that ORCID enables you to do is if you are a Trust. <laughs> no, your term is up. I'm sorry, Mike, you're done. <laughs> um, so, but you can probably apply again next year. Anyway, all that to say, <laughs> um, basically, we, we have the possibility with ORCID of using a tool that they provide called the Affiliation Manager, which enables you to push affiliation information into someone's ORCID record for them with their permission. So, you know, this might be for a university, it could be employment information, this person's a faculty member here, uh, it could be education information, this is a PhD that we did grant to someone, yes, they did do this work here. Um, but there are all these other professional activities that you can push as well or can add, which include things like board membership and services. Um, so we have pushed all of the current ORCID Canada Governing Committee members and all of the current Data Site Canada Governing Committee members, we've added that to their ORCID records for them. So now they have a nice little green verified check mark saying, yes, this is a real board uh, appointment that they have. And uh, CRKN is as adding it on their behalf. And we're looking to sort of do that for all of the committees and then go back in time and do it for everyone who's been on them uh, for a while. So Lisa, I'm sure you'll be hearing from me very soon about that. So very specific narrow use cases, but yeah, we support PIDs across Canada. That's that's important. Thank you. It's good to have these multiplicity of experiences and lenses on this. Uh, so Mike, now's your turn. Is there anything left to say on this question of how your institution uses PIDs and why they're important? Um, I think uh, from the use case perspective, probably nothing too illuminating. We use um, the data site in our Dataverse installation. Uh, and so are all of you who have a Borealis install for your uh, research data management collections. Those all mint data site DOIs automatically. Uh, Crossref and OJS. Um, for me personally, I also, because of my role with PKP, I manage our Crossref sponsorships. So that's like over 150 journals we're sponsoring DOIs for um, and covering, you know, Deposit support, and I work closely with Crossref. I'm on their Slack. We help each other solve problems related to persistent identifiers on the regular. Um, all pretty normal stuff. Um, I'm also involved in. Uh, I'm on the technical committee for Coalition Publica, the partnership between PKP and EduD, where I'm answering a lot of questions and working together with people to figure out responses to PIDs there and what metadata gets pushed into which locations. Um, so yeah, I'm almost always sort of standing in this intersection of of publishing and metadata and persistent identifiers. The one you case I would mention that hasn't been mentioned yet is um, I use PIDs a ton when I'm just trying to figure out what faculty can deposit. Um, OA works in particular, share your paper, um, and the share your paper uh, like license checking spreadsheet where you dump in a, a DOI and it tells you all of the information about that uh, publisher and that publication and what you can or can't share is a huge time saver. <laughs> I use it all the time. Um, it's really, really handy. I think this is, um, we did, John mentioned, we got a couple of questions about ARC. Um, and I honestly, like, I can't imagine a scenario where I would use ARC for faculty publications because the the reasonability of the metadata and the interchangeability of the metadata is never going to be that kind of useful as it is with Crossref, where I can dump a DOI in a place and pull all of the metadata into Zotero or pull all of the metadata into my open access rights checking database. And all of that stuff is based there, or even open Alex, honestly, um, which is pulling a ton of metadata from the Crossref API. So um, it's really the context for publications. Um, I can't imagine using anything other other than uh, a DOI and specifically almost Crossref. Um, but as I say, data site and Crossref work really closely together uh, to uh, establish these things. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's it. Uh, and obviously, I think PIDs are important. 
um, because I never stop talking about them, <laughs> even when I want to. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, can you describe the current state of PIDS in Canada and how you see that landscape evolving in the next three to five years? We'll start with John. Good choice. Uh, <laughs> I think from the top down <laughs> PID strategy and PID program perspective, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to do this at a high level. Um, basically, like Mike already highlighted, the sort of three gold standard PIDs that I think are more and more at the heart of any PID strategy or any situation of PIDs uh, where PIDs are useful are ORCID IDs for scholars, DOIs for a variety of research outputs, and ROAR research organization registry IDs for places. Um, ignoring the variety of sort of uh, proprietary competitors in those spaces, those are sort of the three open PIDs that we are probably using going forward. In terms of adoption in Canada, we certainly don't have even, I'd say, 50% adoption of ORCID IDs by scholars. Maybe we have 20, maybe we have 30. It certainly depends on the institution, the region. Um, for example, at the moment, I think there's a little less representation in Quebec than there is in some of the other parts of Canada for a variety of reasons. So in terms of actual scholars creating and using an ORCID ID, we're a ways away from, you know, 100% adoption or 70% adoption, whatever is a reasonable future to imagine. And, you know, Lisa was highlighting how one of the roles that the libraries often play is in supporting adoption and maintenance of ORCID records. And of course, once we get to the level of Every system that needs it is integrated with ORCID and we can push and pull metadata. This will be a lot easier for scholars because the, you know, the publishers will be able to add publications or data sets post publication into someone's ORCID record for them with their permission. The affiliations will come from the appropriate universities and various funding networks and the funders will push their grant IDs. All of these things will be going in and out of different parts of the system automatically. That's the ideal, and that's sort of where I'd like to see us in five years. Uh, that's that's you know that interoperable big picture is where I think everything should be going. Um, but yeah, for now we don't really have as wide adoption as we'd like, and and it is I think to libraries to both support that, but also for universities as institutions, not just the libraries, the research offices too, to make sure that ORCID is integrated into their various systems. And then beyond ORCID alone, of course. Um, the ecosystem for DOI registration is pretty wild at this point. You know, we have some institutions that are using DataCite because it happens to be more affordable for their journal articles, even though Crossref is the appropriate choice in terms of the metadata. But in terms of cost, yeah, maybe DataCite with the fee offsets we provide is more available to some of those people or some of those institutions. Um, we have institutions like uh, UVic, which, which has chosen to use the metadata schemas as the guiding choice for when to use Crossref DOIs versus when to use DataCite DOIs. We have institutions that aren't registering DOIs for a variety of things that could be registering DOIs, whether those are publications. Almost no one's registering DOIs for theses, for example. Uh, you know, UVic is one of the few in Canada that's looking into that and more should be doing that. So there's a lot more entities that need PIDs applied to them. There's not a lot more connection that needs to happen between those different PIDs and their metadatas uh, and their metadata schemas and the information that can be passed back and forth. And yeah, in three, three to five years, I'd love to see a significant uptake, up, uptick in the interoperability between these PIDs. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important that we think about how PIDs are being used, not just in the library, but across our institutions at large. Um, so I'm going to shift to Mike and see what uh, see what you think about the current state of PIDs in Canada and where you see it going in the next three to five years. Um, I guess this is a great question because I think I think the the DOI stuff for publications is working pretty well. I think most library publishers in the country are using Crossref DOIs, and that's not much of an issue, or they're using DataCite, which isn't, again, the better of the two for publications, but it's still better than no uh, DOIs for publications. Um, and I think uh, as we sort of pivot to this national repository hosting solution, uh, so far dubbed Scalaris, the, the IR version of Borealis, or Borealis, I'm calling it, now that they're calling it Scalaris, um, is that I think, I think we're gonna see a lot more of um, a supported 
uh, sort of best practices driven approach to applying DOIs to those things instead of a bunch of people kind of trying to figure it out on their own. You can just sort of turn to the community of practice and say, hey, what are you doing? And they will tell you what they're doing. And then you just set yours up the same way. Um, uh, I'm similarly flirting with the idea of doing DOIs for theses. I think I might actually do crossref for our theses because theses are supported in the crossref schema. And I would love to link references um, as metadata. So um, there's some interesting, interesting options here. Um, I think the big one will be ORCID. And this is really going to be dependent on whether or not the tri-agency decides to leverage ORCID in their new grant management system. Um, if, if they pull it off, um, then that would be great. Um, and then I'd have a really great use case to go to faculty and say, you will never have to fill out a CCV again. They can just suck all your publications in via ORCID. And that would be really nice. Um, so I think, you know, in the next three to five years, that's maybe the biggest the biggest pivot point. The other may be, um, depending on how this uh, tri-agency evaluation of the OA policy goes, um, reporting. And if the question of reporting becomes one that they're particularly invested in, they may start to do things like they're doing already with data management and um, checking deposits uh, using open scholarly infrastructure, particularly open air. Um, in Canada, all of our repositories that use Dataverse um, push to further and further pushes to open air. So if you know someone's ORCID uh, and their data set is in open air, they can just go look to see if you've deposited it. Uh, and I think that kind of use case is going to become more and more common. Um, actually using the PIDs to identify the researchers and the research outputs sort of in a scattershot way. So you can see all of the works related to a publication. Um, uh, in particular, Crossref and DataCite. Crossref's working on this new um, relationships API that's supposed to be able to expose connected uh, works, much in the way that OpenAir kind of dedupes and shares works together. Um, so it would be possible, you know, to be able to see an article and then see, even if they didn't link it, see the linked data set and then see where the preprint is and then see all the other versions of the preprint and all of this other stuff um, can be exposed. So my guess is um, that uh, both of these things will kind of be on the wish list for both researchers in the tri-agency, uh, the question will be whether or not um, they pull it off without paying somebody's nephew an inordinate amount of money to make something that doesn't work. Uh, that's probably, that's what I bet will happen. But but the other thing would be really cool. Thanks, Mike. And Lisa, do you have any thoughts on the current state of PIDs in Canada and where you see it going in the next three, three to five years? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that the funders are getting much more involved now in these conversations around PIDs is absolutely critical. As Mike was saying, the funders can kind of drive researchers' adoption more easily than the libraries can. Um, <clears throat> I think what we're hearing from major tri-agency funders is that there's not really an appetite to mandate ORCID IDs, for example, in applications, but just having the presence of a kind of an ORCID ID will be in those application forms is something that's going to, you know, raise researcher, um, you know, interest in the whole thing. Um, I think that the other thing that will drive more adoption for ORCID is more integration across platforms. So the better we have plugins between different platforms, the more easily that data can flow. Um, I think the more likely researchers will understand the kind of real use case for these um, I think as well that there's a lot of uneven adoption in libraries. So for me, like because we're this is the sector that we're in, I'm really, really interested in um, if you're not a member of data site CA, then then why not? What is your library doing? What are you planning around PIDs? Do you have a different solution? Um, if you are a member of data site CA, but you're not minting PIDs, which is quite a large group of the members, right? We have a lot of people who have bought a membership, but they're not actually minting the PIDs. So I'm really curious to hear from those folks, why, what are the challenges that you're having minting PIDs? Um, and then finally, for those who are minting PIDs, do you have a good plan for, for maintaining these PIDs over time and for tombstones and for other things? Um, so to me, just really basically getting PIDs onto objects that libraries publish in open access platforms would be a critical thing for us to work on. Um, and there are a lot of challenges, obviously, that people are facing, and most of our most of us are not looking at very good budgets this year either. So um, understanding better what those challenges are and how we might be able to collectively overcome some of those things would be, I think, a key uh, a key problem for for data site CA to be working on, for example. Great. Uh, thank you. 
Um, looking at the time, Julie, would you say we have time for one more question? Yeah, let's do one more question and then we can uh, turn over to um, to the Q&A. Sure. Um, I'm thinking of skipping down to the final question, if, if that works for you, Julie. So, um, Mike, you talked about connected infrastructure in the introduction, and John, you talked about an interoperable uh, big picture, and Lisa, you just uh, mentioned the uneven adoption of PIDs. So, the final question is sort of asking you to talk a little bit more about the gaps that we have, and this question sort of arise out of a conversation that we had about like basically, when will be we be able to see all the faculty publications at my institution? Like, what are the pieces that are missing that prevent us from being able to just click a few a links and and finding all that wonderful data that would be so handy? I'm just like rubbing my chest. What a great question! <laughs> uh, I think it's your turn to go first, Mike, so you can dive yeah, in. Yeah. Um. When faculty and publishers uh, prioritize it. Um, you can't have that metadata if it does not exist. And for many of our publications, it exists at the point of publication. Um, there are lots of publishers that are really quite bad at metadata. I was uh, sharing a story recently of a bunch of, we had like 500,000 records we pulled from Crossref for some research. And there were like 50,000 records from Springer that did not have titles. Uh, they instead submitted a single white space as their title metadata. And when asked to update it, they said, no thanks. <laughs> so there are major problems. I think people make an assumption that the, the publishers are really doing their due diligence in this space, and they are not. Uh, they do some due diligence. Um, there are also huge gaps in metadata fidelity across all of publishing. Certain disciplines just decide that, for example, first names should always be a single initial. <laughs> there are all kinds of just profound issues with publishing and the way that we talk about metadata and what metadata fidelity looks like. Um, so, you know, if you work in a field where, um, you know, your affiliations are more about a research group you're in, or uh, you just write the department of your your institution and don't really write much else or whatever, um, you know, what are the odds you're going to click on a drop down menu that pre populates a ROAR field that people can use later? How likely are you to update an ORCID record? How likely are you to log into your ORCID record and allow Crossref to automatically write records to it when you publish? You know, we can't make people use ORCID. ORCID's entire selling point is authors are in control of this thing. And I think very often researchers and institutions kind of go like, oh, well, once we have ORCID, everybody, we can just get all this stuff. Well, no, <laughs> researchers have to let you get that stuff. <laughs> they have to put it in the place where you can get it, and they have to give you permission to take it. So I think, you know, there's, I think the gaps here are largely literacy. I think a lot of people think that this stuff is sort of automagical. We've had the same sort of conversation around Uniweb at our institution. Well, we'll get Uniweb, and then we'll just have all the stuff. Well, the stuff has to exist for you to take it. Um, you know, recently, I was in a meeting at Coalition Publica, and somebody said, well, you know, we need all of our funding metadata. Uh, it's a requirement at, at Coalition Publica we listed on our publications so we have all of our funders and our information. But when I looked in Crossref, it wasn't there. And I turned to the person who manages the schema at EDD and I said, do you deposit your funding information at Crossref? And he said, no. I was like, well, that's why you can't find it. <laughs> You're not putting it there. But people just don't understand. I think they think this stuff is just getting sucked into a big machine without people actually having to do the work to put it there. Um, and the secret is people have to do the work to put it there. So so to me, you know, the 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 way this happens is it has to be as easy as possible for researchers so that it is essentially an afterthought that they barely have to think about it at all. Um, but they are still going to have to get an ORCID record of their own volition or you will have to physically grab their hands and smash them on a keyboard for them. There's no other way to do that. You can't make them for them. That's a total breach of trust in the agreement of what ORCID is supposed to be about. Um, and then uh, people just have to be resourced and understand what's up. And this is kind of the other big piece of the conversation. I think we've seen an extreme degradation of ITS uh, sort of taking over library system staff across the country. And a lot of schools either don't have the capacity to run a repository in OJS on their own, or they can't update it, or they can't uh, configure things on the systems they do have, and they go with software as a service. So um, I think People may get a data site account, just like ORCID, right? Like John, like how many schools have ORCID memberships and don't use a single one of their, I know we're one, <laughs> a single one of their API keys. That's just me. I'll get around to it, I, I promise. It's on my to-do list. Uh, but like those things aren't uncommon because once you get the API key, once you have the keys, you need to figure out how to turn the ignition, right? These are like, these are real, these are real issues for people from a logistics standpoint. Do you have the support to do those things? Uh, no, I don't yet use it in OJS, John, but it's coming. 
Please look at the face he just made. I, it's fine. I, I just don't, I haven't had time to explain to editors what's happening. It's going to happen. It'll be okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's a longer haul than it seems. I think people just kind of and this has been my hesitation to sip it out. I I wrote a lot of things saying, you know, I'm really worried about this going to uh, university administration first as like look at this magic way to see all the research that happens at your institution. We can just get you all this cool stuff without really much of an understanding of where that stuff comes from, where that labor comes from, who decides where to put it. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of a lot of concerns there. Thank you. Um, Lisa, do you have any thoughts about gaps? I do. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think honestly, it's more gaps than not at the moment. We are not at a point that we have the kind of adoption that is going to allow us to do really cool things with the data, create a, a really comprehensive graph and, and do, as Mike suggests, you know, even know what are your faculty publications? We rely on faculty and that means that we need to convince faculty to do this work, right? We need to help them understand that this is not just like another academia.edu profile. It isn't just an online list of your stuff. It is actually structured data on the back end that allows that information to be shared widely among research systems to your advantage. It also allows your work to be found more easily. So just helping researchers to understand why would they bother doing this work? Because, you know, it's almost impossible to get their attention as it is. Um, I think that grant IDs are quite an important piece of the puzzle because the researchers and the funding and the uh, publications in many cases are tied to grants. So you need structured data to describe the grants that exist. Um, and grant IDs really have to probably be moved along by funders. So uh, I think that that's something that's kind of missing from the ecosystem. I know that the funders are now thinking about that problem. Crossref does have um, a way of minting IDs for grants, and they've got a metadata schema for that. So there's something possible there, but we're not there yet. Um, finally, one thing that I would love to eventually see is for ORCID to be kind of providing some kind of authority and provenance uh, information. So, for example, now at UVic, um, our researchers are being asked to look carefully at their research partners to, I mean, effectively, I think it's the federal government trying to um, discourage international spying. So now our institution asks our researchers to verify that their partner in China, for example, works at a certain institution. That's a kind of a ridiculous thing to ask a researcher to do. That is an institutional thing, right? So if UVic can go in to people's ORCID profiles and say, we confirm that this person is a researcher at UVic, then we can actually use that as a little bit of an authority system. Um, and I really like that. I also think there's a possibility of like, when you review, a journal could push to your profile saying, this is somebody who's reviewed for us. Obviously not like what you've reviewed, but just confirming some of that stuff. So you start to be able to use this system um, for authority. I think we're still quite a ways out on that, but there are certainly things already happening in ORCID that maybe move in that direction. That would be extremely helpful as well from my perspective. So, thank you. Great, thanks. And John, do you have the final word on gaps? <laughs> cool. Well, since since I think we've heard a lot about metadata quality and the responsibility of different stakeholders and getting PIDs into systems so that things can be passed back and forth, maybe what I'll just focus on briefly is the other kinds of PIDs that are representing other kinds of digital research entities that, that currently aren't really adopted in Canada. So even if we are having challenges around adoption of ORCID IDs, DOIs are, are doing okay, but again, the metadata quality question, all of these things we've just talked about, I think that they sort of exist largely in researchers and scholarly infrastructures awareness. Where we're seeing emerging PIDs are, of course, as Lisa highlighted from the funders, we would love to see them not just integrate ORCID uh, into their application system, but we would like to see them registering grant ID DOIs so that each grant can itself have its own PID and then be connected meaningfully through publisher workflows, right? So instead of having to type out, this is the agency and here's the text acknowledgement of the funding, like I can just plug in the ROAR for the funding agency and the grant ID for the funding itself and boom, voila, there's PIDs connected to my publication specifying specific grants and stuff like that. And beyond that, we're talking about um, the two other sort of emerging PIDs uh, that have not had much at all adoption in Canada are RRIDs, Research Resource Identifiers, and RAID, I, or RAIDs, uh, Research Activity Identifiers. 
Raids are project level PIDs. So what that means is that they sit in between funding, collaboration, and publications. Because it's one thing to have a specific publication and say, here is one or several sources of funding, and here are one or several roars associated with the various co-authors, and here's the single output. And another thing to say, okay, these three people are working together across borders on this one project, which has seven different publications and data sets associated with it, and multiple gray literature reports, and, uh, you know, multiple sources of funding across multiple rounds of funding from different governments and agencies and countries like all of that isn't really well captured right now we can try to visualize that as we start to connect pits together but having a pit at the project level could help and our ids are for things like um resource usage you know if i've used an mri machine to do something from a specific institution to do a study in neuroscience well it's helpful to be able to cite that resource um it's helpful to be able to cite specific data sets or specific portions of uh, dynamic data sets and various instruments that helped uh, enable the creation of them. So uh, that both of those are not really adopted in Canada, and they represent gaps in terms of the kinds of things that get PIDs. Because otherwise, it's just ORCID for people, DOIs for outputs, whatever that might mean, um, and then ROARs for places. But these other things need PIDs too, potentially, and, and those are some possible solutions in the future. Make it sound very exciting, everybody. So, so in the in the last uh, few minutes that we have, uh, does anybody have any questions? Looks like we have. Oh yeah, sorry, Melissa. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, Julie. No, Melissa, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, Emily put uh, two questions in the chat. Um, so the first is, uh, how can PIDs help us avoid proprietary metric stuff? Are there people who want things like SciVal and Overton? And can I see a role for those queries uh, showed against the Crossref API being useful for at least some of it? I feel that some of this functionality is down the road and lots of people want more metrics now. Uh, only too true. So uh, I guess let's address that one first. Anybody can chime in. It's a free for all. <laughs> um, I OK, I'm not confident that anything can help us avoid it because those companies have a lot of money. And if I've learned anything in the process of them beating us to open access and then making it hugely profitable for them um, without billion dollar budgets, uh, I'm never going to get rid of these people. <laughs> but this stuff does exist. Um, and Open Alex is kind of the start of a conversation around that stuff and other services like Unpaywall that sort of leverage uh, the metadata about where people publish compared to your collections and what people are reading um, that would give you a good idea as to how you might handle those things. And actually, the best person to answer this question on this call is actually Julie. Uh, <laughs> this is what Julie does. <laughs> but I think that this is uh, this is definitely a thing that is happening. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as the proprietary metric stuff, you know, the reason that people like Elsevier can provide a lot of this data is that they have a lot of the data in one platform structured in a consistent way. And so, yes, ultimately that's, that is what PIDs will do as well. And it will do it more globally and more consistently if, if researchers can put their data, you know, if they're motivated to share their data with ORCID, for example, then I certainly think that we're moving towards that. I think at the moment, um, it doesn't really compete because there is there are so many gaps in the data that's available right now. So you wouldn't be able to confidently say, here are all the publications from my institution just through ORCID data. Eventually, you should be able to, though. And that one of the things that's critical there, and it doesn't work that well in SciVal either, is that you need those organizational IDs to be applied consistently. If you are the University of Victoria, there are at least seven other universities around the world that have very similar names to ours. And when we look at SciVal data, for example, we definitely find that our researchers are sometimes affiliated with other institutions or people who are affiliated with us actually live in Africa somewhere. So, um, you know, keeping getting that data clean and using PIDs more and more will allow us to do things that right now we're paying people like Elsevier to do. And it'll open that data up in a non-proprietary way so we can all use that data in a variety of ways. That to me is a very important kind of part of the vision for the future of this open PIDs infrastructure. Yeah, yeah I'll do it. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. 
Uh, just very, very briefly, all I wanted to say was the around the sort of open infrastructure part of this. Lisa's already basically said this, but um, you know, while the data is not there yet, what we want is to be able to say that you know, in Orchid, you have information that isn't locked in just Elsevier systems, right? Scopus is great. Scopus ID is helpful if your publications are in Scopus, and that's certainly not everything. It's not everything from the global south. It's not everything from the humanities. It's not. You know, it's it's a very specific subset of research that is very well supported and has very well supported metadata and very well supported publication platforms. And while, you know, some of the challenges that exist in the research ecosystem are replicated inside ORCID because garbage in, garbage out. If the better metadata exists for natural science uh, outputs, then you're going to see better metadata in people's ORCID records than what exists for humanities outputs. Um, but that is sort of the promise of these open infrastructure PIDs and the open APIs that they have is that we can pass metadata back and forth and hopefully ensure that it is of good quality in a way that things that are just proprietary inside one specific system owned by one company, no matter what that company does, it's never going to have control or coverage over everything. And that is why having ORCID be bottom up and scholar maintained and having scholars put their information in ORCID or have it put them for them with their permission is what ultimately enables this to be as effective as it or will enable it to be effective. Uh, yeah, but now we don't, it's not there. It can't compete yet, but eventually that is the goal, you know, across borders, across systems and across proprietary uh, entities. Um, I was just going to add two quick thoughts based on what John said, just small things. One is the, or well, actually based first on what Lisa said, the metadata part and research organizations, I think um, it's very easy to assume that once ROAR reaches a certain capacity where we're recording them regularly, that we're still going to be able to tell the story in the immediate. Um, much like we said that it's nice, you know, you need to be able to update uh, an, a persistent identifier for them to really mean anything. That stands for its metadata as well. So, you know, all of the existing publications that had a specific value in that field or didn't have it at all won't suddenly have it in all of its back issues just because we've started to adopt Roar. So this idea of the fullness of scholarly publishing, having up-to-date metadata would require all of those publishers to give enough of a shit to update it. Um, and it's a huge amount of labor to go back and update all of those things. So I think that's a really important piece to remember that, you know, Roar adoption, I think is going to happen one way or another. And I don't think most people are really going to even have to care about it. It'll just kind of happen. But its existence in that metadata working backwards, uh, that that's going to take generations. <laughs> like That's not just going to happen automatically. And we'll, we, nobody's going to flip a switch and we'll be able to see all these publications. The other part I was going to mention is that OpenAir does some of this uh, deduping and aggregation work for metadata already. So for the institutions that are pushing their metadata to OpenAir, if it exists in other places, say repositories. So let's say you have a publication published in an open access journal, but it also had a version in an institutional repository and then a version in archive. If you go to OpenAir and look at a record, they can show you all of the places that they've received metadata from. So Zenodo and your repo and the publisher. And they sort of amalgamate like a super record and then dedupe existing pieces to show you a full record that is actually more than the sum of its parts in kind of an interesting way. Um, and I think that that's actually ultimately a a really great use case for the ability for this open scholarly infrastructure to pull metadata quality kind of out of the toilet is that all these other places that ends up in can start to bolster the quality of the metadata at the point of the original publication. Um, so there is some capacity there. Um, and adoption of open air has been pretty steadily increasing, I think. Um, it is my hope that it will someday unseat Google Scholar as our default place to put things. Thank you so much. So we are out of time. Emily, I will also just chime in real quick and say that I think um, I think there's definitely a place for PIDs and uh, with the with Open Alex and um, the upcoming um, trend in open scholarly infrastructure. I think with a combination of that with um, having conversations with your research office about like Dora and the Leiden manifesto. I think if you, um, I think those are two really important things that are going to have to be sort of pitched uh, to the research office about responsible use of metrics. Um, and also, you know, talking about like Mike talked about um, what Scopus can capture or or, sorry, uh, John mentioned what Scopus captures versus what it doesn't, especially in Canada, where there's a significant gap in our bilingual uh, content in uh, in these proprietary 
um, systems. So if you want to chat further, um, I will put my contact information in the chat and uh, you can get in contact with me if you want to continue talking. Um, so just to wrap up, I want to just say a great big thank you to Lisa, Mike and John for their time and their willingness to share their insights with all of us. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended today and contributed to our discussion. Special thanks to Melissa for all your work um, helping to moderate today's panel. Uh, please feel free to reach out to myself. Again, I'll put my contact in the um, in the chat. And if you have any uh, questions or concerns, you can reach out to Cynthia or myself. Um, and just a reminder that this session will be recorded and disseminated later on. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.